back at Berkeley. Go Bears! <laughs> well, it's just exciting to be here at the TED conference and to see all of you guys. I've been listening to everything this morning, and of course listening to uh, the Beatles song brings me certainly back to my, my era here. You know, um, so my story starts actually here in Berkeley. I arrived here in the midst of the feminist movement, and you know, we women were not going to take it anymore. We were fed up with men, you know, doing everything. Our brains were just as smart as theirs. There is no gender in the brain. The brain is unisex. Well, I then decided to go into what was then a man's field, medicine. And I started taking classes here in biology and in about hormones and the brain from Miriam Diamond and Frank Beach. Of course, when you're 18 or 19, you don't know that you're studying from some of the greats uh, in their field, but it was very exciting. And I learned very soon that I was wrong. So today, I'm going to tell you about my journey and how I changed and discovered that there is no unisex brain. So, you know, we all start off, there we are, there, now if that sperm entering that egg, that sperm is carrying an X, you will be female, if it's carrying a Y, you be male. And what that means is that at about eight weeks of fetal life, so there's, there's the fetus cooking away, at about eight weeks of fetal life, the tiny testicles in the male start pumping out huge amounts of testosterone that marinates the brain and the body and changes it into the male brain. Now, if you're female, your brain develops unperturbed by testosterone. <laughs> so by the time we're all born, we either have a male brain or a female brain. And what that means is that we have circuitry. And it just sawed off the top of our brains, the male and female, there's all kinds of little areas that that marination in testosterone cause some areas to grow larger, some areas to shrink, and the female without the testosterone, some of her brain circuits developed in different ways. Now, you all know that the male and female brain are more alike than they are different. After all, we are the same species. And I think that um, one of the things to remember is that we all absorb our culture and what people tell us what we're supposed to be doing, our parents, our churches, our education. So our circuitry in our brain may become primed into the world to be developing in the male direction or female direction, but at least half of our circuits get built also by the gender learning we do in our culture. Now, I remember um, living over actually in Unit 3. I was in Ida Sproul Hall, Unit 3. <laughs> Brow was all females and we had a curfew. <laughs> we would hang out in the hallways and I remember having this conversation with, with some of my hallmates and we had decided that when we had children, we were going to raise them with gender neutral toys and you know we were going to raise them just the same. And when our future daughters-in-law would thank us for the sensitive husbands we had raised for them. <laughs> Everything that the guys we were currently dating seemed to lack, right? <laughs> At any rate, that lasted as long until we had our own sons. And I can remember um, when my finding out that at 13 weeks pregnant, I found out that I was going to have a boy, and I felt like I had been hit, and I said, oh my God, what am I going to do with a boy? <laughs> and then I immediately thought, though, because I thought, 
oh, but he'll have such an easier life. He's going to grow up into a culture that's wired for males. And, you know, so little do we know things are going to change a lot in the next 20 years. But I remember buying him one Christmas a doll and wrapping it up, and he gets under the Christmas tree, rips off the paper, opens the box, and he seizes the doll by her torso and immediately starts using her legs as spears. <laughs> I thought, oh God, I give up. <laughs> so this was the figure he preferred, right? The, the hero figure. And of course, anybody of you that knows Eleanor McAfee, wonderful, detailed, observational work for 40 years down at that other place across the bay, Stanford. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she meticulously cataloged and in her preschools of three and four years old and the type of play that they, entered, they liked and all kinds of details. So the boys would like the rough and tumble play and they would, you know, chase around after heroes and, you know, upsetting all the things the girls would play with. And girls have a particular type of play interaction that's called relationship play. They, and role playing, they will do something like, okay, you be the doctor and I'll be the patient. Or you be the mommy, I'll be the daddy. And they will sit for hours and do that. A little boy will sit with them and do it for maybe one turn of the game and then pretty soon he's like, bored as all heck, and he's up and out of there. So even from the beginning, and no one's taught these children at three, four, five, six to do that. And by the time kids are about six, they start living in like self-segregating. They enjoy playing with members of their own sex a lot better. And then, okay, I don't know what these two creatures here, the teens, are doing, but imagine what's on that computer is something that the parental controls were left off. <laughs> So, at any rate, let me tell you what I learned. I'm going to give you one slide just to tell you the whole enchilada about how hormones rock and roll us. Okay, you see that big first hill down there where it says birth. Now that's while we're in utero and about a year or two after we're born. Our ovaries or testicles are making almost sometimes adult levels of either estrogen or testosterone. And they're marinating our body and brain, changing all of us into the gender that we're going to be. Now you see that flat area there? Now humans have this whole period where there's almost no sex hormone being made. Does anyone know what that's called? It's called childhood. <laughs> so it's actually a time when the pituitary is not telling the testicles or ovaries to make hormones. But look what happens at puberty. You're ready for the rock and roll there. For girls, it starts at about 10 or 11, boys about 11 or 12. And what it does to the male brain is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you have a special area in cells, if you're a straight guy, that uh, likes this picture very much. My husband looked at my slides this morning, he goes, oh, that's one I haven't seen before. <laughs> decided on that moment to come today, wherever he is. <laughs> Sorry, darling, I know I'm out of you, but whatever. <laughs> there is an area in the hypothalamus, where the hypothalamus has lots of cells where we get hungry and we eat and we, you know, lots of urges. There's an area called the area for sexual pursuit. And the marination of the testosterone makes it grow to 2.5 times larger in the male brain than in the female. Now the female of course has it too, but you guys have yours 2.5 times larger. And it does what male nature wants you guys to do. Your main job on the planet is to seek out fertile females. Now fertile females have large breasts because they have lots of estrogen from their ovaries, which means they're fertile. So you see you guys have this mother nature made it so you would like this picture if you're seeking out fertile females to inseminate. Okay, ladies. <laughs> so you guys, basically, you're kind of really done biologically once you do the deed. And there we go. Now, this 25-fold increase of testosterone 
from age 9 to 15 and boy, the ladies, I just want you to remember this one slide, because if you don't know, and this is on page 33 of the male brain, it, this is the cliff notes to the male brain. <laughs> Those circuits that were laid down in fetal life are now running on their testosterone fuel, up to 25-fold rocket fuel. Okay, guys, so, you know, you can't help it, right? You just have to learn to be civilized, but... Anyway, we, we, we forgive you. Uh, the teen boy brain, so. <laughs> any of you people have teenage sons? Uh, any of you ladies? Well, mine used to spend a lot of time behind locked doors, whatever. <laughs> That's the time you quit talking to your mother, right, guys? It's like, ah, uh, uh, there, mom. So, but I guess this guy looks like he's doing pretty good. He's already got a six pack, right? But <laughs> we don't know what's behind the town. But let's hope it's large enough. Um, <laughs> so that this, I put this slide in to remind, to tell women that you know guys really do have a lot of, they have a lot of worries about their anatomy too. It's not just us ladies with thinking about whether our breasts are small enough or large enough or whatever. So the teen boy brain gets very interested in his own anatomy. Um, Age 13.5 is the average age for first wet dream for males, and that's kind of telling you that that's when puberty starts. Everything is working, all the parts are working, and so that's the onset of puberty for males. And for girls, about 12.1 or 12.2 is the first menstrual period um, on average. All right, here's our other counterparts. Um, I always like this slide because this is the... Uh, this is the ones who stop talking to their mothers completely, or else they're screaming at their mothers. <laughs> Girls have a 15-fold increase in their estrogen level during this time because the ovaries start pumping out all of that estrogen. I was talking to a mother backstage who has a, an 11.5-year-old 11, an 11 daughter, and those ovaries of hers start to make some estrogen, and if you see a little girl with a bit of a, you know, the little breast bud right before they decide they want a training bra, that means estrogen is coming enough to cause breast development. So you can tell about a year from that point is when most girls will start their period. So that's onset of puberty. And where it's marinating the brain and the body and all parts. And girls get very interested in something else. They want to be attractive to males, and this is not a media-caused event. All over the world, in all cultures, you know, you've seen the tribes in Africa that do scarification and make scars on their face, or, or the long earlobes, or stretch the necks. The girls that are 9 and 10 years old in those cultures can't wait till they get to do those things, because that's considered beautiful in their culture, and they want to be beautiful and attractive to males. So we females have all this stuff. I can remember at that age, there was a magazine in those days called Seventeen Magazine. I don't know if it's still around. It's still around. <laughs> you know, I'd study, at 13, I would be studying those, thinking, like, how am I, I going to do this? You know, <laughs> What am I supposed to look like? But, some of that's overdone, and I think we need to really, you know, try and help our girls be healthy. And I love the lady that talked about food earlier, trying to get people to eat healthy at a very young age. Really important. Um, so, this skinny mini stuff, I know, so for the birds. But girls want to be beautiful, and they start doing it at a young age. Okay, now, I've been talking about straight folks a lot. The gay brain. We don't, as scientists, even though we've been looking very hard, people have sliced up every part of the brain, looked at every part and seen if the connections are different, the cells are different, or the hormones are different. So nothing has really been pinned down yet. Um, but it's very clear that at the same time as puberty starts making straight guys look at girls and have the girls be their sexual objects of desire, that um, gay guys start looking at guys, and those are their objects of sexual desire. And it unfolds naturally at the same developmental time. So I tell my uh, audiences in the Midwest, it's just not a moral issue. You know, you're born like that, it unfolds naturally at this time. And we don't understand what the differences biologically are, but we know the behavior is certainly different. The one study that's interesting out of Sweden showed that they put the straight guys and gay guys in a brain scanner, and then they had them smell the pheromones of females, 
and the straight guys' pleasure center lit up. If they smelled the sm pheromones of guys, it kind of went into the disgust center. <laughs> and gay guys smelled the pheromones of males, and their pleasure center lit up. And if they smell the pheromones of females, the disgust center lit up. So um, that's kind of as good as we are at this point. And the trans brain we know even less about. Last time I spoke here at Berkeley over at Millbury Union, um, which a, a group of uh, trans um, <coughs> students came up to me and we had a really interesting discussion after the talk for about three hours. My husband wondered where the heck I was. <laughs> but they were basically telling me what the experience was when they started taking testosterone and they'd been females um, to male. And they had just switched to males taking their testosterone for about a year and switched to using male bathrooms or at that stage of the transition. And this one guy says to me, when I was female, all my girlfriends used to come and talk to me about all their problems, and I really valued that part of who I was, that they would come talk. But since I've been taking this testosterone this year, I just don't want to hear their problems anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, I just think you would want to know that. <laughs> I said, yes, thank you. So that's, that's, what, that's where we're at with the, the science in this area at the moment. Okay, back to the female brain and what I call the eight-lane highway for processing verbal and emotions. So to me, that trans experience says our circuitry is probably very, very similar, and then the hormone fuel that runs the different circuitry probably has a lot to do with our sex differences. But I wanted to come back to the female brain and tell you a little bit about what I actually do at UC Berkeley. And um, the menstrual cycle is basically going up and down, waves and waves of hormones in different parts of the cycle are going over your brain. The PMS will come. I, I have a lot of couples figure out what to do with PMS. <laughs> mommy brain though. <laughs> okay, and then the hormones and the mommy brain, you see that big giant up and down mountain, that's progesterone going up and then it flat it goes, you fall off a cliff of about a hundred thousand units of progesterone go up hugely. And postpartum depression is something I also treat. So a lot of women get postpartum depression. You want to have a mom that's lively, you're interacting with the baby, you're building the circuits and you want to have higher IQs and better school performance in your, in your baby, you do not want a depressed mom. So those one in five moms that get postpartum depression, we gotta get them better, right? We gotta get them better and keep them better. Okay. There's another guy in the, adult in the house, is the male brain, the daddy brain. And I don't wanna leave guys out because I think they're a very critical piece of this whole thing. I think that, all right guys, you don't know it, but the pheromones of your pregnant partner are wafting over into your nostrils and they're doing decreasing your testosterone and an increase in a hormone called prolactin. And that is what we think forms the daddy brain. And you're able to hear infants cry better in the middle of the night. Ladies, remember that. They can hear infants cry in the middle of the night. And we've got this, this is the ultimate, guys, in daddy brain. Ladies, I think we should be choosing men that the hormones then affect him in this beautiful way, you know? And dads are really important. I remember one of the reasons I'm interested in postpartum depression is when I'm, my brother was born, my mother got a postpartum depression. And I remember the house got very quiet, and she didn't smile very much anymore. And so, fortunately, there was another adult in the house who would play with me and laugh. And that, of course, was dad. So dads can really help us get through lots of periods of life. Kids need two parents who are wired up to help us grow into the best human beings we are capable of being. So I just want to thank you for being a terrific audience. And this is how I changed from thinking there was a unisex brain to realizing that there is no such thing as a unisex brain. So take possession of your own and go out and be the best you can be. Thank you so much.